Welcome. Is anybody learning anything this week? How many people have learned something since they've been coming? That's awesome. Give yourself a clap. That's good. It's always good to keep learning. So welcome to those of you who are here in the sanctuary, and we welcome those who are watching us online. We really wish you could be here with us, but we're happy that you're joining us. Uh, we do want to let you know that there are kids' activities downstairs during the service, uh, which is supervised. Our prayer team, we have, could our prayer team stand up? Darlene and Kathy, if you need prayer, they will be downstairs, and they have the lanyards on so you can identify them. And uh, take advantage of that. We can always do with one more prayer. Um, there's also food for those of you who have just slipped in from work. If you need to grab a bite, now would be your last call to scoot down and get that. Um, and don't forget, we're back here Wednesday night at 7 p.m. There is no Thursday evening. We'll be back Friday night. And on Sabbath, we have the divine service at 11, a luncheon, and then we have a, the final session will be 7 p.m. on Sabbath. Uh, now, Jeremiah Davis, he's always asking us to get into our Bibles. So if you didn't bring your Bible and he asked you to hold up a Bible, there's Bibles in the back of the pews. So you can always hold that one up, okay? <laughs> okay, have a great night. Scott? Hello, family. If you can please bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, every head is bowed and every eye is closed. There is silence, Father, in your sanctuary because we are seeking to hear your voice. And your voice, Father, is still and small. It is amazing, Father, that you are all-powerful, all-present, and all-knowing, and yet you can be so, so quiet, so intimate. We are grateful for leading us here tonight. We pray, Father, that you will fill this place with your Holy Spirit. Father, whether we are here in the sanctuary or whether we are um, joining from home, may you unite us through your latter reign. May you stir and move in the mind, heart, and soul of each one who is here, who is watching online, either tonight or in the future. And may you transform hearts. Father, if there is someone who has been thinking about baptism, encourage them to speak with Pastor Morris. May we continue to learn from your word and may you continue, Father, to anoint the speaker for tonight, Pastor Jeremiah Davis. Continue, Father, to be his passion. Continue to inspire him to share what you say to him. And may we be willing recipients. It is in the name of Jesus that we live, pray, and serve. Amen. Thank you. Good evening. Happy Tuesday. Yesterday I said happy Tuesday, but it was Monday. <laughs> so now it's happy Tuesday. Our opening hymn is taken from 618. Stand up for Jesus. Can we stand? Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift up his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. 
stand up, stand up for Jesus. The strife will not be long. This day, the noise of battle, the next, the winter song. To him that overcometh the crown of life shall be. Thank you. You may be seated. Good evening, brother. It's time for a little quiz. Okay, so I guess you have done your homework. I assume you do, you did. Fill in the two blank. Based on directly on Daniel 12, 1. <clears throat> we need a relationship with Jesus Christ as two word. Based directly on Daniel 12, 1. We need a relationship with Jesus such as, such as, pardon me? Give her a gift, please. Number two, in order. Name the three feasts that relate to Jesus' second advent. In order. Second advent. Passover is the first. Keep going. The, uh, uh, okay. You, uh, you, you got the first right, you got the last right. Can somebody have them all three? With Give her a gift, please. <laughs> Number three. On the day of fat men, the sin of the children of Israel were confessed on the head of the scapegoat. But that's not the question. <laughs> <laughs> what did the leading of the goat add into the wilderness symbolize? What did the leading of the goat add into the wilderness symbolize? You remember? Pardon me? Give, 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 give. <laughs> the people have been separated from their sin and rebellion against God. Have you noticed that God was never to be returned? You know what I mean? Thank you. All right, evening. I'll be sharing Health Nugget with you again tonight. So I'm going to give you a list of amazing benefits or amazing things, and you're going to see if you can figure out what I'm talking about, okay? So prioritizing this one thing leads to all of this. Better academic performance, higher self-esteem, greater sense of resilience, lower risk of substance abuse, lower risk of teen pregnancy, lower risk of depression, lower likelihood of eating disorders, lower rates of obesity, better cardiovascular health in teens, bigger vocabulary in preschoolers, and healthier eating patterns in young adults. Any guesses what I'm talking about? And if you say it, say it loud, because... Okay, any other guesses? 
All right. So I am talking about family meals. <laughs> so having dinner together, or just a meal together, it doesn't have to be dinner. <laughs> so this is surprising, right? So the impact of eating family meals together, it reaches far beyond the table, as we can see. So there are tons of studies that you can find that validate all these points. And here are some more. So family meals, they improve physical health by promoting better dietary habits and food choices. And when eating as a family, family members are more likely to eat fruits and vegetables um, and make those better food choices. It directly promotes the health and wellness of a family and has the power to fight health issues such as obesity and malnutrition. And the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse at Columbia University concludes that frequent family meals increases the chances of parents raising drug-free, healthy kids and can also decrease household stress for everybody because kids have a lot of stress these days and teens. And family time spent during meals allows parents to build stronger relationships with their children so that they can understand their children's day-to-day -day life and keep them on a healthy life track. Family bonds create support systems that can maximize the success and well-being of all family members. So sharing a meal together is a meaningful and effective approach to starting conversations and building trust and self-esteem and coping skills in your, in your children and in your family. Um, and when they sit down together, children and teens become better at handling the stresses of their daily life and better at speaking to others and speaking up for themselves and more confident in their support system. So um, some tips are just keep a list of, say, 10 family favorite meals that you have and recipes that you can draw from and make it easy for family members to help in the prep of the meal and setting the table and eat dinner earlier in the evening if you need to accommodate other activities. Whatever you can do to make it happen. Prepping meals ahead um, can make it more enjoyable as well and less stressful to get it on the table. And... Um, and just having this, these family meals together, you make lasting connections um, with, your, with all family members. You have heartfelt conversations. And you also have traditions that you are um, passing on, but that your child will look back on and, and really cherish. And also, um, the nourishment of it is very important. It's just, it is beyond the food, though. It's not just what's on the plate. It's feeding the body and soul of everybody, as well as providing sustenance for physical health and emotional fulfillment. And it also strengthens your family ties. So, as I said, it strengthens your bonds together. And it really lays a foundation for a lifetime of love and support with one another. So it's not worth the risk of skipping out on these precious, this precious time together. So try to make it a priority, even if it's just uh, a few times a week. It's worth it. Thanks. Good evening. Are you happy to see me? I'm happy to see you, <laughs> and you know what I'm all about. So I'm going to tonight, just to make things um, move along quicker, I'm just going to read uh, a verse or two from uh, the Bible uh, regarding our offerings. But this I say, oh, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7. But this I say, he which sows sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which sows bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, as, according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So let's with gladness give whatever we can, we give to the Lord, and he will bless us, he will bless our gifts. So um, I will ask uh, the deaconesses to come forward. Are they ready? Deaconesses? Okay, they're going to be coming. Um, so we know that 
the Lord, uh, I've experienced this in my life. I can never outgive God. You know, whatever I give, I've never felt uh, hurt by it or that I missed it or God blesses us as we give. So let's all uh, bow our heads uh, for prayer uh, before we collect the offering. Dear Lord, we pray that you would bless this offering and may all be to your glory and honor is our humble prayer tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, which art in heaven, we need you to revive us again tonight. If ever in the history of this world that we needed you, Lord, we see clearly we need you right now. Abide with us, grant us your presence, and we thank you, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Good evening tonight. I don't know about you, but I look forward to this time that we can open up the Word of God and study together, amen. You know, all of heaven is interested in what is going on in this church right now because God is interested in our salvation. What a wonderful God that we serve. Uh, you know, I, I don't know everyone's name here, but when I look out, I try to remember your face. Every night, I look at the faces of those that are sitting with us. And throughout the day, I try to lift you up in prayer, maybe not by name, but by face. I look at each one and I see the ones that are sitting and I'm praying God that he does something for us. And I believe that God is in all of his power trying to save us. And do you know that nothing can stop God from saving us but our own choices. And tonight we can choose to say, Lord, I want you to do something for me that has never been done. Amen. This is what God is wanting. Now you remember that last night I gave you a challenge. Amen. Do you remember what the challenge was? The challenge was no screen, no television for how long? Three days. And I can see some of you already start taking the challenge. I can see the little shakes. <laughs> I see the little addiction, uh, Benson, but, but, but you made the challenge. Amen. You took it. Praise the Lord. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge your braveness, your courage, 
And I want to ask and I want to see the hands of those that took the challenge downstairs and upstairs. I want to see the hands of those who took the challenge to say, Lord, I'm going to do this by the grace of God. I'm going to do this. Let me see your hands. I see a few hands. Praise the Lord. That's, that's a good amount of hands. It went up. The brother said he can't do it. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something, my brothers and sisters, and I'm not challenging our brother here, but I'm going to tell you this. If we cannot come to a place where we cannot, like remember what I said now, we're talking about particularly looking at this in recreational experiences. I'm not talking about just looking, all of a sudden the news come up and you see the weather and, and, and that come back for a couple of seconds. I'm talking about the screen of where we're spending our time. You understand what I'm telling you? Now, my brothers and sisters, anyone who cannot break the addiction with the screen will not be ready for the coming of Jesus. Impossible. There's no question in my mind. The Bible is clear about this. But now, my brothers and sisters, three days is just a little bit of time. Now, we're only on night one, right? Now, now this is, tonight is bringing us to night one. You said, please, night two, this is night two. This is bringing us to night two. Now, on Wednesday night, uh, Pastor, I'm going to then try to see if we can negotiate and see if we can get another three nights. Amen. <laughs> uh, but, but, but I'm not going to tell you that. But just, just from now, we're going to go on three nights. Now, you'll know what happens. Do you know that, that when you start doing something for three days, do you know that the beginning of a habit is formed? And something in the brain called neural pathways begins, grooves begin to start deepening after a while of doing something again and again and again. I want it to become a, 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 a habit for us to turn off devices and turn on Jesus Christ. Every time you pick up a phone, you should think in my mind, have I talked to Jesus already? Do you remember I told you last night, if we did, to our cell phones, what we did to Jesus, we would have a relationship with Christ. We're so dependent upon these things. And God is trying to now change the dependence, making a radical change from us depending upon worldly things and to us depending upon Jesus Christ. I want to do that. What do you say? And so we're going to go three nights uh, by God's race without television. Now, uh, I, I, in, on, they have something here called CTV. You know about CTV, don't you? Do you know if there was a radio announcement made and it appeared somewhere on CTV as well that said, if you would come to this meeting every night, that you can get $10 million. Can you imagine if they aired that, if they aired that on CTV? A man, I, I mean, that, that man, and it said, look, if you, but you had to come every night and bring a Bible. You had to come every night, bring a Bible and take notes every night with children. Do you know that this building, this church will be filled to capacity? They said $10 million. And can you imagine the child, he comes in and says, Mom, Dad, I, I can't go tonight, not tonight. You say, shut up. We're getting ready to get $10 million. Isn't that what you would say? Yeah. say but, 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 but what about class? You don't need class $10 million. But it's amazing what we would do for money, but we will not do for the master. Do you know that the eternal life is worth more than $10 million? Do you know what it was purchased with? The precious blood of Jesus Christ. Do you know if we really believe that, then we could not miss a single night. We would not plead any excuse. We would not say, well, what about school or work or play? Because when it's something that we want to do, we find a way to do it. You have something here that's called uh, Boxing Day. Am I right? On Boxing Day, people get sleeping bags. Am I right? They will wait at department stores with sleeping bags. They don't ask how long are we going to be there. They don't ask what time. They will be in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning. They're there wiping sleep out of their eyes. Is it time yet? Just so they can get a new device. One of those big screen televisions, maybe free, just so they can get the newest iPhone, just so the latest gadget or the latest device, man will inconvenience himself and lose sleep. Why won't we do that for Jesus? I think that's a problem. 
But by God's grace, that problem can be fixed tonight. What do you say? And what God is trying to do right now, and he's trying to wake us up because he understands that we don't have much time left. Would you take your Bibles and turn to Esther? What book did I say? I'm going to tell you why. We're going to Esther chapter 3. I'm going to tell you why tonight. Tonight, the reason why we do this is because we don't understand the love of Jesus. We don't understand what Jesus has gone through. We don't understand God. And as a result, we no longer understand ourselves. We have lost our identity. We have lost our what? Identity. And my brothers and sisters, we're going to find that in order to do what needs to be done today, we cannot do this without a knowledge of who we are and whose we are. And Satan's plan is to destroy the identity of God's people at this time and the midst of this crisis. Was there ever a time where a person in the Bible had come to a crisis of the ages? And in order to meet that crisis, they had to recognize what their identity was. Was there ever a time like that? Does anybody remember a person in the Bible like that? Does anybody remember the name of that person? What was the name of that person? Talk to me, somebody. Esther. You remember the phrase in, the, in Esther chapter 4 it said that who, who knoweth that she had come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Who knows that this revival has come to bury Canada for such a time as this? Who knows that you have come to this church, not just from invitation, but that God is looking for somebody that will stand for him in such a time as this? I believe he's calling us. What do you say? Now, in the book of Esther chapter 3, notice what the Bible says in Esther chapter 3. Now, I want to ask you a question. Was Esther her name? No, Esther wasn't her real name. (laughs) Esther was her Persian name. But it wasn't her real name. You remember that Esther sought to have fit in into the Persian kingdom without trying to enlist attention. But there came a crisis that made her, in order to save her people and be a blessing to the world, it made her had to identify or realize her distinctive identity. And we're going to find that today in this last generation, that what Esther did before her crisis, you and I must do before the final crisis. Esther did three things. How many things? Three things. I want you to write this down. Three things. Esther did three things. Number one, Esther, before she could be a blessing to the world and help her own people because you remember her own people were getting ready to be persecuted am i right every one of them getting ready to be destroyed and esther had to make a decision i'm not going to pretend that i'm just a queen in the kingdom i've got to identify my distinctive identity and recognize it and realize it three things she had to do and the first we just identified The first thing that Esther had to do was realize and recognize her distinctive identity. Not her Persian identity, but her distinctive identity. Was Esther different? Yes or no? She was. And the first thing she had to do was realize and recognize her distinctive identity. The second thing that Esther had to do before she could bless the world and help her people was number two, she had to embrace her distinctive identity. She had to do what? Embrace. Now, what does that mean? For example, is it possible to know I'm distinct and different and yet not like it? Yes or no? Do you know, brothers and sisters, that Seventh-day Adventists are the most distinct people in all the world? There's no religion like this religion. And in order to be a blessing to the world, In order to save our own people, we must begin to realize and recognize the distinctive identity that we have as Seventh-day Adventists. I'm going to tell you something. This meeting is not so much for Barry in the community. We may call it a community outreach, but I'm going to be honest with you. The Holy Spirit told me this is not for the outreach. This is for us. Do you know that we will never reach the world until the church is reached first? And the Bible said to the Jewish nation, he said, you can pass sea and land to make one proselyte. But when you make him, you make him twofold more than child of hell than yourselves. But before God can reach the world, God must first wake up the remnant. Can you imagine what would happen if God brought all Barry to this church? What if just all, the, the entire community came here? Where would the members be to take care of the church? Who would take care of all the hundreds coming? Imagine setting up a garden. You plant acre and acres of, of, of fruit and fruit and, and, and a great harvest. Do you know how much food you can grow on an acre of land? What would happen if you only had two people to reap the harvest? What would happen? The food would spoil. 
it would die. What would happen if God were to bring thousands upon thousands into the church today? It would die because of the condition we're in right now. And so God does not now work to bring many into the church because of the condition of we as a church. And so the first thing that God does before reaching the community and the world, the first thing that God does is produce a revival and reformation. And do you know there's enough people in this room that if we truly experience revival and reformation, there's enough people in this room to reach not only all of Barry, but the entire world. This is what the devil's afraid of. But in order to do that, number one, we must realize and recognize our distinctive identity. We're not like everybody else. We must understand that from the Bible. Number two, we must not only realize that, but we must embrace it because today, everything that is seven Adventists is amazing that we as seven Adventists, we hate it. Just name it seven Adventists, we hate it now. Seven Adventists diet, we hate it. Seven Adventists dress, we hate it. Seven Adventists music, we hate it. The devil is trying to make us hate ourselves. Because there's no way that we can share with the world this most beautiful message if we ourselves don't know what it is and we don't like it. And so we must learn to embrace our distinctive identity. And then number three, Esther had to be willing to manifest, to disclose, to reveal that distinctive identity to the entire world. And do you know that at Seven Adventists, there's a message that God has given us that must go to every nation, it must go to every kindred, it must go to every tongue, it must go to every people. But it's going to start not out there. You know where it's going to start? Right here and here with us. And brothers and sisters, I want it to start with me. What do you say? I wouldn't be looking around and be thinking, I wonder if someone else is hearing the message. I wonder if someone else is getting ready. I, I would begin looking in my own heart and saying, Lord, am I ready? Because you know it's a shame? You know what would be a shame? If we came to prayer meetings and weeks of prayers, we came to church, we had our name on church books. Can you imagine if I preached this message and still became a castaway? What worth would it be? That's why the apostle said, I'm not going to preach the truth to others and myself be a castaway. It's not worth it, brothers and sisters. Can you imagine you being an elder or a pastor or a leader or a member? Can you imagine controlling the sounds? Can you imagine controlling the camera? And then being lost. And God says, it's nobody's fault but our own. Can you imagine someone said, but I didn't hear. God said, no, wait, you didn't hear? You uploaded the the, the, the presentation. You reviewed it. You preached it. You taught it. You studied it. You came night after night. My brother and sister, this is not a fairy tale. What we're studying is life and death. There's no joke. If I were you, I would say, As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I will be bringing my wife and my husband, my children, my family. I will be bringing the family members, whoever we are, saying whatever I can do. I will try to reach every seven minutes I knew and say, please come to these meetings. We have but a little time left. And do you know that if we're lost, the only one that we can blame is not God. God did everything for us. What more could God do than he's already done? My brothers and sisters, I'm so thankful that tonight is not too late. Tonight, we can make a decision that we're going to be saved by the grace of God. Tonight, we can make a decision that our family is going to be saved by the grace of God and that God would use us to reach Barry and the entire world. What do you say? I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to look, I'm going to be very honest with you. I'm going to look on that, that camera for a moment. If you are in Barry, you need to be in this meeting right now. If you are seven Adventists, I'm going to tell you something that, that, you know, very soon man would travel for hours to come to a meeting like this very soon. But then it's going to be too late. But tonight, it is not too late. I'm so thankful. What do you say? And so, brothers and sisters, we said that every night, we're going to spend two minutes talking to God. Amen? Now, Esther did not have forever to get ready. You know that, right? How long did Esther have to get ready? Was, 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 Was there a limit for Esther getting ready? Does anybody know what the limit was for Esther to get ready? Look at Esther chapter 3. Look what the Bible says in Esther chapter 3. Look what the Bible says in Esther 3. You're there, amen? The Bible says in Esther 3, beginning in verse 14, Father, anoint your words, we've opened it. In Jesus' name, amen. In verse 14, let's read it together. The Bible says, the copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in where? Every province was published unto all people that they should be ready, not Anytime they want it. But it says that they should be ready. Was there time for her to be ready by? Yes or no? 
It says that they should be ready when? Ready for what? Talk to me, somebody. That they should be ready where? It says that they should be ready against that day. So there was a specific day for them to be ready by. Is that what the Bible says? Yes or no? Now, you must understand something. Even though we're reading Esther, what was written in Esther was written for our last days upon whom the ends of the world are come. Look what the prophet says. Volume 5, page 449 and 450, it says, church and state are now making preparations for the future conflict. Protestants are working in disguise to bring Sunday to the front, as did the Romanists. Throughout the land, the papacy is piling up her lofty and massive structures, and the secret recesses of which her former persecutions are to be repeated. And the way is preparing for the manifestation on a grand scale of those lying wonders by which, if it were possible, Satan would deceive even the elect. Let's read that last sentence together. It says, the what? Decree which is to go forth against the people of God. Talk about the National Senate Law Decree. Will be what? Very similar to that issued by Hasuerus against the Jews when? In the time of Esther. So then when we look at what happened in the time of Esther, it's going to be very similar to what's going to happen in the last days. We find that Esther did not have forever to get ready. Esther had to be ready when? By the day of a particular day. What day? Look at the verse 15. Verse 15 says, the post went out, being hastened by the king's commandment. And what's the next two words? And the decree was given in Shushan the palace. So Esther had to be ready by the day of what? By the day of what? Of the day of the, of the decree. Now my brothers and sisters, I wonder if there's going to be another decree that we need to get ready by, yes or no? I wonder if there's going to be another law that's coming that will bring persecution. It was that way in Esther's day, and it's going to be very similar in the last days. And God is saying, please, while we still have opportunity, let's get ready while there's still time. And so tonight, brothers and sisters, we want to spend two minutes praying. Dear God, make me ready against this day. Amen. Is two minutes a long time? It's not a long time. Would you reverently kneel with me as we approach the Lord in prayer? Oh, Father in heaven, Lord, we sense your presence here tonight, and we're so thankful that you're interested in our salvation. Lord, though we have turned our backs many times on you, your hand is stretched out still. And with long suffering, with loving kindness, you're seeking to call us back to your side before it is too late. I pray, Lord, that you would send the Holy Spirit down from heaven to convict and convince our inmost souls that now is the time to surrender all to Jesus Christ. 
I pray, Lord, that you will go through the airwaves and through the internet and move upon the hearts of thy people. I pray that you will walk up and down in every pew of this church from upstairs to downstairs, that you will minister to our hearts, showing us, Lord, that it's not my brother or my sister, that it is me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. I pray, Lord, that you would open up our minds, that you would remove every distraction, that you would close talking mouths, and that you would gather distracted minds and fix us and focus us on Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that you'll remove me. I'm fickled, I'm feeble, I'm frail, but Lord, you are strong, you are mighty. I pray, Lord, that you will allow the Holy Spirit to so fill this place that we will know that we have been with Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you will now tabernacle with us, grant us your Holy Spirit, for we ask all of this in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you will take your Bibles, we want to turn to the book of Amos, to the book of Amos chapter 3. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. We're going to the book of Amos, the third chapter. And when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. Amos chapter 3. What book did I say? We're going to Amos, not three, we're going to Amos chapter eight. Amos chapter eight. Notice what the Bible says in Amos, the eighth chapter. Now, I want you to listen to me carefully tonight. Brothers and sisters, I think that it's becoming more and more evident every night that goes by that we're living in the most significant time of all the ages. I believe we see that a prophetic storm is gathering all around us. That the crisis of the ages is deepening, is thickening around us, and every nation is lining up tonight. Everything in this world is getting in step. We believe truly now from the Word of God that we're standing on this threshold of great and solemn events and that every end-time biblical prophecy of the Bible is being fulfilled right before our very eyes. We have seen this night after night clearly from the Word of God. And the Bible tells us that very soon there's going to come a time where man will run from the east to the west, from the north to the south. He will run from the furthest part of Canada to the uh, farthest part of Canada trying to hear the word of God, but then God's spirit would have been withdrawn. Can you imagine? Today, man thinks it's something to come from Toronto to Barrie. Man said he traveled a long distance, but very soon man will come from Yukon to New Brunswick and think that whatever he could do to get to Jesus, it wouldn't be too much. The Bible tells us very soon, brothers and sisters, that man will be looking for the last opportunity to hear salvation, but he would have waited too late. Notice what the Bible says in Amos chapter 8, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Beginning in verse 11, let's read that together. Amos chapter 8, beginning in verse 11. What does the Bible say in verse 11? It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send, what, a famine in the land, not a famine of bread. Not nor a thirst of water, but a hearing of the words of the Lord. What do you mean? The Bible is right there. You know, brothers and sisters, right now, it's almost amazing that we think just because we have the Bible, that's enough. But you know that that which gives power to the Bible is the Holy Spirit. Do you know that when the Holy Spirit is withdrawn from the earth, the Bible will be just like a novel. It would have nothing else, for, uh, meaning nothing to us, no power if the Holy Spirit is not moving upon our hearts. My brothers and sisters... Very soon when probation closes, man will wish, Lord, where can I go to hear one more voice pleading with me for salvation? And at that time, it will be too late. In fact, verse 12 says, verse 12 says, and they shall wander from what? Sea to sea from one coast to another. And from north even to east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord. And they shall not find it, not just the adults. But even the children, verse 13 says, in that day shall the fair virgins and the young men shall do what? Faint for thirst. Verse 14 says, they that swear by the sin of Samaria and say, thy God, O Dan, liveth in the manner of Bathsheba liveth, even they shall fall and do what? And never what? Rise again. You see, brothers and sisters, we don't understand our eternal destiny is at stake. If we are lost, do you know that it'll come to a place where never, ever in the history of the world will there be another opportunity for salvation? There's no second probation. We only have one time, and probation's hour is fast closing. And this is why God says that before this time, God wants to prepare us. In fact, go with me back to Daniel chapter 12. What book did I say? We're going back to Daniel 12. Now, we looked at Daniel 12 last night, but I want to look at something a little bit deeper tonight as we go deeper in our study, great work, little time. Notice what the Bible says in Daniel chapter 12. In Daniel 12 chapter, beginning in verse 1, notice what the Bible says. We want to look another layer at this and go a little bit deeper into this verse. You know, the Bible so deep, you can read it a hundred times and still there's something new to gain. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, 
Beginning in verse 1, let's read that together. What does the Bible say? And at that time shall what? Michael stand up for the, the great prince which stand up for the children of the people. Now, Michael is just another name for Jesus. You know, in the Bible, Jesus has many names. You know, it's amazing. Sometimes we say, how could that be Jesus? But Jesus has many names. Think of some of the names the Bible calls him. He's called the Rose of Sharon. He's called the Lily of the Valley. He's called the bright and morning star. Do you know that Michael is just another name for Jesus? That word Michael means Michelle. It comes from a word that means who is like God. El, God, Michelle, who is like. In other words, it means who is like God. And the answer to who is like God is Jesus. Jesus was the express image of his father's person. This is another name for Jesus. When Jesus sits down, everything's all right. But when Jesus stands up, the Bible says there will be a time of trouble such as never was. Now, my brothers and sisters, if there's going to be a time of trouble such as never was, we noticed last night, then we're going to have to have an experience with Jesus such as never was. That means that our experience with Christ must be deeper in this last generation than any preceding generation. We must get so close with Christ, so intimate with Christ, so personal must our relationship be that nothing can come between our soul and the Savior. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want us to understand something tonight. When Michael stands up, listen to me carefully. When Michael stands up, God must have a people that are prepared to stand with him. Now, look at this. In the book, manuscript release, page one, book one, page 228, let's read what the prophet says. Let's read together. It says, God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to the world is for what? What does it say? It is to do what? Prepare a people not to sit, but to prepare a people to stand true to him during the investigative judgment. This is the purpose for which we establish and maintain our publishing houses, our schools, our sanitariums, our hygienic restaurants, our treatment rooms and food factories. This is our purpose in carrying forward how much? Every line of work in our cause. Well, what's the purpose, prophet? The purpose is to prepare a people to stand true to him during the investigative judgment. Now, brothers and sisters, does the Bible say the same thing, yes or no? Everything that prophet says, the Bible says. Go with me to the last book of the Bible. Go with me to Revelation chapter 6. What book did I say? We're going to Revelation chapter 6. Now, I want us to see that since man fell into sin at the beginning of time, God's purpose was to produce somebody that can stand. This is the purpose of the Bible. This is the purpose of the plan of redemption. This is the purpose of the everlasting gospel. This is the purpose of the sanctuary. This is the purpose of the three angels' messages. This is the purpose of seven Adventism. This is the purpose of God to prepare somebody that can stand in this last generation. Notice what the Bible says in Revelation 6, beginning in verse 12. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Revelation 6, verse 12, let's read that together. The Bible says, and I beheld when he had opened not the seventh seal, but I beheld when he opened the... Six seal. Now listen to me for a moment. This book in Revelation that has seals, how many seals does the book have? How many seals? Seven. So if this is the sixth seal, what time is it dealing with? I mean, think of it this way. If there are only seven days in a week, and I come to the sixth day of the week, am I dealing with something at the beginning of the week, the middle of the week, or the end of the week? If I'm dealing with the sixth, I'm dealing with the sixth, I'm dealing with not the beginning, not the middle, but the end. We talk about that as the weekend. So my brothers and sisters, if there are only seven seals and God now opens the sixth seal, am I dealing with something at the beginning of time, middle of time, or end of time? End of time. So in Revelation 6, we're watching events that are disclosed at the end of time. In verse 12, it says, And I beheld. When he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as a sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. If you study history, all of these events have already transpired. Verse 13 says, and the stars of heaven fell uh, upon the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. But I want us to zero in on verse 14. Just before the coming of the Lord, we see this event. Let's read verse 14 together. What does the Bible say? It says, and the heavens departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains. It looked to John like everybody was doing this. He said it seemed like every mighty man, every bond man, every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks and the mountains. And notice what they said in verse 16. Let's read that together. Verse 16 says, and said what, everybody? 
to the mountains and rocks do what? Fall on us and hide us from the face that's of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Now, my brothers and sisters, you know that when a man is lost, he has lost his mind. You know that you cannot have a good mind and be, and be lost. If a man is lost, he's gone mad. You say, how do you know? I mean, think about it. If a man starts talking to a rock or a mountain, you know he's gone mad. Am I right? And so these people are talking to the rocks and mountains saying, fall on us. We should have been talking to Jesus. We should have been pleading, saying, Lord, break up the rocky heart that I have and give me a soft heart so that I can know Jesus. The Bible says in verse 17, this is what they're crying, for the great day of his wrath is come. And it, the question is, the million dollar question, the universal question. And who shall be able not to sit? That's not what the Bible says. Who shall be able to do what? Talk to me, somebody. Stand. Now, my brothers and sisters, that is what the universe is waiting for. The plan of redemption is to produce a generation that can stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. But brothers and sisters, what experience must be ours in order to stand at this time? Look at what the Bible says in the book of Hosea. What book did I say? We're going to Hosea chapter 14. Go to Hosea 14. After Daniel, you come to the book of Hosea. Look what the Bible says after Daniel. Come to Hosea chapter 14. Now, my question is, how are we going to be able to stand? Now, can we sin and stand at the same time? Is that a good question? Is that a good question? Yes or no? That's a good question. Can we sin and stand at the same time? Let's see what the Bible says. In the book of Hosea chapter 14, when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Hosea 14, beginning in verse 1. Let's read that together. The Bible says, O Israel. Return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast, what's the next word? Fallen by thine iniquity. Can we stand and fall at the same time? Oh, no. So how do we fall? What does the Bible say? What causes a man to fall? The Bible says iniquity. Now, my brothers and sisters, think about this for a moment. When Adam and Eve sinned, was that called the standing of man or the fall of man? So sin never makes us stand. Sin always causes us to fall. And the Bible says that God in the last generation is trying to prepare a people not to fall, but to prepare people to stand. In fact, in Hosea chapter 14, verse 9, let's read that together. It says, who is wise? And he shall understand these things. You have your Bible? I want to make sure we look at that. We, 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 we can't be a question of man, not have Bibles. Amen? Hosea chapter 14. Notice what the Bible says in Hosea 14, beginning in verse 9. It says, who is wise and he shall understand these things. Prudent and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are not wrong. They are what? Right. And the just shall walk therein. But the transgressors shall do what? Fall. Now, what is the transgressor? What is the transgressor? A sinner. The Bible says sin is the transgression of the law. So a transgressor is a sinner. So the Bible is saying that if I remain sinning as a sinner, I cannot stand, I must fall. And so my brothers and sisters, God today is trying to bring about a situation and an experience in our lives where he can produce a generation that have victory over sin. What did I say? Victory over sin. Now, in this generation, you know, there's a new theology that has come in that says that we will be sinning until Jesus comes. But tonight, we're going to explore the Word of God and see what it says. See, my brothers and sisters, the sanctuary is trying to produce redemption. I want to be redeemed. What do you say? Amen. And we're going to see tonight that there's something very interesting about the sanctuary. Look what this says. In early writings, page 71. Let's read that together. It says, I also saw that many do not realize what they should preach. Is that what it says? You know, sometimes we think about preaching, but that's not what it's talking about. It says, I saw that many do not realize what they should teach. What did it say? What they must. You know, God is more interested in who we are than in just what we say. It says that, that many do not realize what they must be in order to not die, but in order to what? Live in the sight of the Lord without a high priest where? In the sanctuary through the time of trouble. See, my brothers and sisters, the reason why we can be careless and indifferent, the reason why we could just, just come to church and go to sleep or just be talking is because we don't understand what we must be to go through what's coming. This says 
that in order to understand this is those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble, not might, but they want talk to me somebody, must reflect the image of Jesus, not partially, but how? Fully. In other words, we must look just like Jesus. Now, my brothers and sisters, why is it? Now, question, did Jesus sin? Yes or no? The Bible says he was tempted in all points like us we are, yet without sin. Now, in order to look just like Jesus, God must bring us back to a place where we are without sin. But my brothers and sisters, somebody says, well, how come I don't understand that? You know why most people don't know this? It's because it says that many do not realize what we must be in order to live in the sight of, uh, of the Lord without a high priest where? In the... So if the devil could destroy the sanctuary message... He would destroy the understanding of what we must be in order to live in the last generation. He would destroy our understanding of the necessity of becoming just like Jesus. But my brothers and sisters, this is the work of the sanctuary. The work of the sanctuary is to make us just like Christ. Look at 1 John. What book did I say? We're going to 1 John chapter 3. I want us to notice in 1 John chapter 3. We're going to 1 John chapter 3. I want us to notice that this is the work of the sanctuary. In fact, notice what the Bible says in 1 John uh, chapter 3. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In 1 John chapter 3, look what the Bible says. Now, all of this God showed John in type. You remember the question in Revelation 6? The question was asked, who shall be able to? That was the end of chapter 6. Am I right? Last verse of chapter 6. Well, do you know that in chapter 7, God showed John who was going to stand? What did he show John in Revelation 7? He showed John that God was holding back the winds of strife until an angel came and sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. Am I right? And in Revelation 7, don't you remember what happened last night? We studied the Feast of Tabernacles. And we saw that in the Feast of Tabernacles, there was somebody standing before the throne of God with palm branches in their hands, exclaiming victory and salvation through Jesus Christ. That my brothers and sisters, they were standing before the throne, but before they could stand in heaven, God had to prepare them to stand on this earth. And when Michael stands, somebody has to be ready to stand with him. That was what was shown God, uh, shown John the Revelator from God of who was going to get the seal. Those who had the experience where they look just like Jesus. Look what the Bible says in 1 John chapter 3. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 4, let's read that together. The Bible says, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. Why? For sin is the transgression of the law. Verse 5 says, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is what? No sin. Verse 6 says, whosoever abideth in him. Who is the him? Who is the him? Jesus. Remember, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things passed away. All things become new. The Bible says that if we abide in him, what happens? The Bible says in verse 5, and that it, says, who, who, it says in verse 5, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Verse 6 says, whosoever abideth in him does what? Sin if not. So then if I'm sinning, what is it telling me? I'm not abiding in Jesus Christ. You see, my brothers and sisters, the Bible says, if I'm abiding in Christ, I sin not. And then it says, whosoever sinneth, have not seen him, neither what? Now, my brother and sister, remember, the greatest thing we can do is get to know God. That's the greatest thing in this last generation. The greatest thing is to get to know God. That's the greatest thing to know God. But now, notice, notice for, for a moment. Getting to know God is the cause. Victory over sin is the effect. Getting to know God is the root. Victory over sin is the fruit. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is why we will never get victory over sin just by saying, I want victory, I'm going to struggle and struggle and make myself have victory. We'll never get victory like that. The way to get victory over sin is to learn how to develop a relationship with Jesus Christ. And when I know God, I will not sin. Now, my brothers and sisters, someone says, well, that's not so. Well, tonight we're going to see if this were not so, then the great controversy could never be won by Jesus Christ. Or oh, you're going to understand this tonight by the grace of God. Now, my brethren and sisters, inspiration says, let's read this, read this together, early writing 64. It says, time is what? Almost finished. Did we prove that this week, yes or no? It says, do you reflect the lovely image of Jesus as you should? 
Then I was pointing to the earth and saw that there would have to be a getting ready among those who have of late embraced the third angel's message. Said the angel, what did he say? Get ready, get ready, get ready. You will have to die a greater death to the world than you have ever yet died. You know, brothers and sisters, we haven't died deep enough. You know, sometimes we still have love for this world. We love its goods. We love its television. We love its diet. We love its food. We love its life. But the Bible says, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. This says, I saw that there was a great work to do for them and but what? Little time in which to do it. This is what we're studying tonight. Our subject tonight is great work, little time. Would you say that with me? Great work, little time. One more time. Great work, little time. Now, my brothers and sisters, there are many things to study in the sanctuary, many things that we can study in the sanctuary, but there are two things that are essential. Many things to study, but two things that are essential. What are the two things? I want to write on the board. You should write this down in your notes just like this. You'll put one and two. Many things that are, is, are important in the sanctuary, but two that are essential. Now, many things we will learn in heaven about the sanctuary we never learned on earth. You know, people are studying everything about it, but you're going to find out two things. If we don't learn this, we'll never get to heaven. My brothers and sisters, the two great things of the sanctuary is great work and two, talk to me somebody, little time. So there are many things to study in the sanctuary, but there are two things that are essential, and the two things are great work and little time. Now, someone says, how do you know that? Go to the book of John. What book did I say? Go to the book of John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, notice what the Bible says. We're going to find out that just what Jesus focused on is, on is what we should focus on. The same thing that Jesus taught, we should talk. Now, I want to ask if, if, if we have maybe an elder that can go in, we can bring our greeters. They, the greeters can come in now. There's a, the, the, that's about all the people we need to bring in just now. Which is the greeters can come in. Can someone bring in everyone else so we can continue? We don't want no one to miss what we're studying. So we're going to John chapter 9. Thank you. We're going to John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, we want to understand that the way to know what the greatest thing to study is, is to look at what did Jesus study. When you see what Jesus studied, then we know what we should study. Does that make sense? Because he left us an example that we should follow his steps. And so when Jesus looked at the plan of redemption, he saw two things that were essential. Look at John 9 and verse 4. Let's read that together. Are you there? Amen. Verse 4, let's read that together. What does the Bible say in verse 4? It says, I must work the works of him that sent me when while it is day the night cometh when what no making work i want to see did you see it in this verse it pointed out two things that was on jesus mind did you see what the two things were yes or no what were the two things great work little time he said i must work that was the work of him that sent me while it is day the night cometh what was the night it was dealing with the time so my brothers and sisters, we find out that there is a time of redemption and a work of redemption. There is a time of redemption and a work of redemption. And all that saying is great work, work of redemption, and little time, time of redemption. What were the two things? Great work, little time. Work of redemption and time of redemption. This is what Jesus focused on. So my brothers and sisters, what you and I must do tonight is to look at this. Now, you're going to find out that all this week thus far, all we have been studying about was actually just one of these two things. We've been looking at the time of redemption. We've been looking at that little time. But my brothers and sisters, I want to ask a question. What is more important, time or work? Was that a good question? Now, both are important, but one is more important than the other. If I were to say, let me ask another way. What is more important, the Sabbath or man? Both. But the one is more important than the other. Am I right? What is more important, man or the Sabbath? Man. man. Do you know that Jesus said that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath? You see, the Jewish nation misunderstood where the value was. God placed the value on mankind. It's amazing today that in America and in Canada, we put more value on animals than we do on man. It's amazing. I, I, saw, I saw today while I was walking outside getting some exercise and I saw a woman. She was walking a dog. She had a yellow bag in her hand. I looked for a moment, watching when she was doing this yellow bag, and all of a sudden the dog stops and uses the bathroom. 
And then all of a sudden, she comes behind him and picks it up and puts it in her hand and then carries it around with her for the next to the walk. She wouldn't even do that for her child. You don't have a baby use the bathroom and you just pick up the, 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 the using the bathroom and then put it in your pocket. You don't do that for that. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters, here's a, uh, uh, the dog. They put little booties on the dog, they, the little foot on the dog and sweaters on the dog, giving him beds to lay in. I mean, feed the dog with the highest treats that you can buy. And then a man is outside begging for money, begging for a dime or a quarter at the light. And we turn our heads from that man. How can we value animals above man? We should be ashamed of ourselves. But you know, every pagan religion, every pagan religion exalts animals above man. Do you know that they, they exalted cows and, and, and serpents and, and birds and food for, for, for the beasts? But the religion of God is sacrificed an animal to save the man. You see, God's religion teaches us that nothing is more valuable than mankind. Jesus died to save you and I. And my brothers and sisters, God is trying to show us today that we are more valuable. So when we talk about great work, little time, both are important. But I'm going to tell you something. Work is more important than time. The purpose of time is to accomplish a work. To everything, there's a season. And a time to every purpose under heaven. There's a work to be done. And some people say, I've heard somebody say, oh, I'm waiting for the coming of the Lord. I just can't wait till Jesus comes. My brothers and sisters, we would not say that so care carelessly if we, did, if we understood what the work was. You see, in order to be ready for the coming of the Lord, there's an experience, and we're happy for that, but we say, first, Lord, give me the experience, because that's what Amos says when he says, the day of the Lord is going to be a day of darkness, a day of paleness, a day of, uh, of gathering of paleness in the face. Why? Because in order to be ready, there takes a radical change that must take place inside of us. Now, my brothers and sisters, we looked at the time of the sanctuary. I want to test you tonight. What is... The time or little time or the time of the sanctuary. What is the totality of the time? Remember, great work, little time. What is the time of the sanctuary? Can somebody tell me what is the time? You have all of the answers already. I just want to make sure that you're reviewing and understanding what you review. What is the time of the sanctuary? Now, look about it. Look, look, tonight, nobody's going home if you can't answer these questions. <laughs> So what is the time? It's almost like saying right now, what is the gospel? And you say, well, the gospel is good news. You ever heard somebody say that before? And I said, what is the good news? What is good news? Well, what is the news? Don't just tell me that the gospel is good news. Tell me what the news is. Tonight, we're going to know what the news is. See, most people have never heard the good news of the gospel. Tell me something. Is it good news just to know that Jesus died on the cross? Is that only good news? Do you know that when the angels first heard that Jesus died on the cross, they did not smile. They cried. Because their Redeemer died. The one they love died. The good news is not simply Jesus died. That hurts. I mean, t talk to me, somebody. Somebody says they're smiling and laughing up and down. <laughs> I've heard some good news. You say, what'd you hear? I heard that my wife died. You say, that's good news? No, no, it's more serious than that. More serious than that. No, it's more serious than that. My brothers and sisters, you find out when you look at this, that's not good news. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us to see how serious this is. The Lord, time is running out, and it's because that we don't know and love you that we are in the condition we're in right now. Please help us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. My brothers and sisters, it is not good news just simply to tell somebody that Jesus died on the cross. We must understand the entire story. And in the sanctuary, the plan of redemption gives us the entire story that makes the death good news when you know the rest of the story. And so, my brothers and sisters, the time of redemption is seven thousand years you should have shouted that out to me uh -uh. the time of redemption is seven thousand remember at the end of redemption redemption means restored that means that we must be in the same place we were in when sin before sin entered the world where was man before sin entered the world were we in heaven or on earth do we have access to the tree of life yes or no we were on the earth and so when the plan of redemption is finished, where shall we be? Back on earth, having access again to the tree of life. And so my brothers and sisters, that's not true after 6,000 years. But it is true after what? 7,000. God finishes everything in sevens. And so my brothers and sisters, the plan of redemption is a story of 7,000 years, the history of redemption. So the time of redemption is how long? How long is the time of redemption? 7,000. 
Now, that redemption plan is broken up into two parts. 6,000 on earth, 1,000 in heaven. Are you with me? Now, my brothers and sisters, that is it. Now, do you know that what I'm teaching you this week, every seven evidence used to teach it. A man by the name of Jane Andrews. Let me hear, hear this, see the hands of those who have heard of a man by the name of Jane Andrews. You know, there's a great university, we call it, for seven evidence called Andrews University, named after this pioneer. Look at what he taught. I'm going to be honest with you. Because today, many would teach what he taught was wrong, and today, you see that what he taught was right there in the Bible. Look what it says. It says, in his sixth article, Jan Andrews stated the same concept. Look what he says, last paragraph. After seven of these weeks of years came the year Jubilee. In this year, liberty was proclaimed throughout all the land to all its inhabitants, and every man returned to his own inheritance. This signifies that after the great Sabbath, during which the earth will remain uncultivated, how long? For a thousand years, the great week of 7,000 years being finished, the curse will cease. After having consumed the earth with all who are wicked, then the earth will be created anew by the power of God, and all the just will return to their inheritance in the new earth and never know sin nor sorrow anymore. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is what we used to believe as Seventh-day Adventists. This is what the Bible teaches, but today we have left what God has taught. It's almost like today, sometimes he would almost have to take his name off of many of our universities because we no longer teach what we once believed. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says the time of redemption is how long? You know it now. How long? Talk to me. 7,000 years. How many on earth? How many on earth? 6,000. How many in heaven? 1,000. And then Eden lost becomes Eden restored. Now, most of our time this week has been looked upon that time. Now, tonight, I told you that we're, by the grace of God, we're going to find out how close are we to the end of that 6,000 years. Do you want to understand that? But we will not understand that fully until we understand first the work. So we're going to look first, not at the time of redemption. We looked at that a little bit, but we have not yet talked about the work of redemption. So tonight, we're going to introduce the work of redemption, and then we're going to close by showing how close we are for that time to run out. Amen? Now, look what the Bible says. We want to understand now this work of redemption. Inspiration tells us very carefully, it says, I saw that there was a great work to do for them and but, what everybody, but little time in which to do it. What is the work of redemption? Turn with me in your Bible to the book of Leviticus. What book are we going to? Leviticus chapter 25. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 25. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. We're going into Leviticus chapter 25, and we're looking at the work of redemption. In the work of redemption, we will find that the work of redemption, Jesus symbolized the work of redemption with two symbols. How many symbols? Two symbols. The symbol of the lamb and the symbol of the priest. So my brothers and sisters, we're going to find that those two symbols, the lamb and the priest, actually represent the two works of redemption, the two works in the sanctuary. And so the lamb represents Jesus, am I right? But it also shows us his work. The priest represents Jesus, but it also shows us his work. Now, how do I know that the lamb represents Jesus? How do I know that? What text in the Bible tells me that the lamb represents Jesus? Because see, everything we believe as seven Adventists should be in the Bible, amen? You see, all that seven Adventism is, is the religion of the Bible. It's a wonderful thing. When everything you believe is in the Word of God, that you don't have to make up one thing. All you have to do is go line upon line, text upon text, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Question, where does the Bible say that Jesus is the Lamb of God? Where does it say that? In John chapter 1, verse 29, it says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. What about Jesus as the priest? Does the Bible say Jesus is the priest? Where in the Bible does it say Jesus is the priest? In Hebrews chapter 4, it says, seeing that Jesus has passed into the heavens, we have a great high priest. And the Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 tells us that. So we can see that Jesus is both lamb and priest. Now, my brothers and sisters, Jesus the lamb, Jesus the priest. Now, someone says, but I thought you said from the Bible that there are three places connected to the sanctuary. How can there be three places but only two works? How could there be only three places or, and two works? What are the three places? Outer court. What else? Holy place. What else? Most holy place. So how could there be only two works if there are three places? Well, think about it. I want you to look at it for a moment. In the outer court, that's the work of the lamb. 
In the holy place, that's the work of the priest. In the most holy place, that's still the work of the priest. So the lamb works in the outer court, one. The priest works in the holy and most holy place, two. And as a result, three places, but only what? Two great works represented by the lamb and by the priest. Now, my brothers and sisters, you will remember that when Jesus died on the cross, he said something. What did he say on the cross? It is finished. We're going to see, brothers and sisters, what he meant by that when you go into the sanctuary. The place to understand is that his work as a lamb was done. But when his work as a lamb was done, his work as a priest had just begun. I like that. You like that? Would you say that with me? When his work as a lamb was done, his work as a priest had just begun. One more time. When his work as a lamb was done, his work as a priest had just begun. And so the plan of redemption was not finished, but only his first work as a lamb was finished. He still had a work to take place in the most holy place, in the uh, place, places of the heavenly sanctuary, holy and most holy. So now, my brothers and sisters, this makes us have to understand what was the work of the lamb? What is the work of the priest? Because this is the work of the sanctuary, the work of redemption. Are you ready to study? Yes or no? Leviticus 25. You there? Amen. You already know that the burden of this passage is the plan of redemption. Every verse is trying to unfold this. We're putting the pieces together. And right now, you can begin to see what we're doing. You remember that if we're going to put the puzzle together the last days, we had to do three things. Remember that? In order to put the puzzle together, we had to do three things. Do you remember that? What were the three things? You remember that? First thing was what? Talk to me. We have to understand the picture. Second thing was what? We had to put together the what? The borders or the edges or the limits. Remember that? And then the third thing was, then we can put together the inside, the heart of all of it. And then all of it starts making sense. Already, we have put together the picture. We know what the picture is. What is the picture that all of coming events in the Bible is putting together? What is the picture? The plan of redemption. And that picture is displayed in the sanctuary. That's the picture. Am I right? From Genesis to the Revelation, that's why, you remember in Leviticus, we read about the Feast of Tabernacles, but in Revelation, we saw why they had palm branches in the antitype. It made sense. The picture was clear. The Bible is trying to put together the plan of redemption. Coming events is doing that. In fact, we're going to find out there's a reason for climate change, and it has to do with the Day of Atonement. You're going to see this. There's a reason why all this is happening now, but my brothers and sisters, we will never understand this unless we see how the picture is put together. And so we're putting together this picture. Then we found out that if we're going to get the picture right, we have the number two, put together the what? Borders, the edges. So what we did in here, we begin to find out there was a limit. We found out that there was an edge to the Bible. We found out the edge is what? What is the edge or the limit of the entire universe? 7,000 years for time. Then eternity in the past will come back to eternity and the future cut off is this 7,000 year period between, uh, between eternity in the past and eternity in the future is this 7,000 history of redemption. This is where the great controversy is all about. Now, my brothers and sisters, once we understand that the limit is 7,000 years, now we can begin to start putting together the inside piece by piece to walk it down to understand what is taking place right before our very eyes. And so we're doing that right now. We're trying to understand what is the work of the Lamb. Leviticus 25, beginning in verse 51. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In verse 51, let's read that together. What does the Bible say in verse 51? It says, If there be yet many years behind, according unto them, he shall give again the price of his, what's the next word? Redemption. We know it's talking about redemption, Leviticus 25 and verse 51. We know it's talking about redemption, but we're trying to understand what is the first part of redemption. What is the first work? It goes on to say, in verse 51 it says, He shall give again the price of his redemption. Let's read that last line together. Out of the money that he was bought for. Now I want to ask you a question. What is the first work of redemption represented by the work of the lamb. Talk to me, somebody. What is the work of redemption? Somebody says to pay for all of our sins. Does everybody agree with that? Now, I want to ask you a question. If I go to the store 
and I want to buy, let's say, some water, and I, I see some Aquafina, uh, uh, some type of water, and I want to buy it, and I go in and I buy it, and I put the money and give it to the cashier, and I give him the money. Is it enough for me simply to pay for it? Is that enough? Or there's something more that have to take place, yes or no? We're going to find this out. So the first part, I pay for it. That's the first part, am I right? Once I pay for it, what happens to the product that I just paid for? What happens to the product I just paid for? Now I can say it is what? It is bought. Does it make sense? So we're going to find out then that the first part of redemption is that man must be bought by Jesus paying the price for our sins. And that's exactly what happened on Calvary. Jesus paid the price for every one of our sins that no matter how much sin we have committed, no matter how many mistakes we've made, no matter how much time a husband has messed up or a wife has messed up or a family has messed up or a young person has messed up or an adult has messed up, do you know that there's blood that has been made available at the cross of Calvary? And we can behold the Lamb of God that taken away the sin of the world so that not one sinner, not one sinner has to die if he comes to Jesus. Do you know this is the gospel? This is the gospel. But now my brothers and sisters, we're going to find that this is about as far as most people get with the gospel. But that's not the end of the gospel. That's only the beginning. You see, my brothers and sisters, this is the first part. Man must be bought. And as a lamb, Jesus finished that work. And when Jesus said, it is finished, what was he saying? He was saying, it is finished. I bought the sinner. I paid the price. My work as a lamb is done because mankind has been bought. Sin has been paid for. Now that work is done. Are you with me? But when his work as a lamb was done, His work as a priest had just begun. There's still something else that has to happen, and no other denomination knows this but Seventh-day Adventists. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is that distinctive identity that we must understand as we go into the sanctuary. Now, my question tonight is, what is the work of the priest? We see the work of the lamb is that man must be bought, but what is the work of the priest? He's doing more than just buying us. Now, I want to ask you this way. Now, look look at this way. If I bought, if I, let's say I came in, and we're in Barry, and I came in, they have a lot of new construction happening here. Let's say I went down one, one place and I saw a, a house that a developer has started, but he didn't finish. You know, if you let the house not finish, it can go into decay. And you can see sometimes boards there. You can see things get old, water spots, stains, things like that happen. And so you begin to start seeing it break down just a little bit. But I pass it and I look at the house and I say, you know what? That looks good. I think that I will fix this up for my family. And I go into the house and I begin to start after work. I begin to start making nice cabinets and putting down nice towel floor. And I begin to start now painting the the house and so forth. Can I just do that? And everything's all right. Can I just start doing that? (laughs) You know what happened all all of a sudden? A man comes in. He's dressed I don't, know how they, I don't know how the policemen look here in, in Canada, but I know how they look in America. You know? <laughs> He's dressed in, in, in his blue. He comes in with his boots on, and he says, sir, what are you doing here? What if I say, well, I like the house, and I just want to fix it up. It wasn't looking so good for the community, so I want to start fixing it up. He would say, you have the right to remain silent. <laughs> Anything you can say and do, it will be held against you. I'm going to, the, I'm going to jail. You, you understand what I'm saying? Why? Because no matter how much I want to fix up a house... It is not mine to do. Do you know that, brothers and sisters, if Jesus had not died on the cross, that he could not fix and restore our lives because he would not have had the right once we chose to sin. We gave ourselves to the devil and we became the devils. We became his. His servants you are. His servants you are to whom ye obey. And so Jesus could not just come in and just fix our life and take away sin. Jesus had to buy us back before he could begin to start restoring us. And so, my brothers and sisters, on the cross, Jesus bought us. And that brings us now to what is the second and final phase of the work of redemption. In verse 55, we see the final phase of the work of redemption. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. 
Leviticus 25 and verse 55. Let's read that together. The Bible says in verse 55. Now, everybody should have their Bible. If you don't have one, please look on to someone. You want to make sure that you can read what is happening for yourself from the Bible. In verse 55, let's read that together. It says, for unto me the children of Israel are what? Servants. They are my servants whom I not bought, but whom I what? Brought forth out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Now, is there a difference between being bought and being brought? Yes or no? What does the Bible say here? Did the Bible say in verse 55 that God has bought them? Is that what it says? What does the Bible say in verse 55? That God has what? brought them. So we find out that the first part of redemption is that man must be bought. The second part of redemption is that man must be brought. You see, God is trying to bring us somewhere. As a lamb, he bought us, but as a priest, he must brought us. He must bring us somewhere. And my question is, where does Jesus want to bring us? Go with me in your Bible, the book of Hebrews. That's right. Go to Hebrews chapter six. What book did I say? We're going to Hebrews chapter 6. I want to show us from the Bible where Jesus wants to bring us. And the place to understand this is the sanctuary. God wants to bring us into the sanctuary, but not just anywhere. He wants to bring us into the most holy place. You see, my brothers and sisters, that means something. In order to get into the most holy place, something must happen to the heart and life of the believer on this earth. In fact, my brothers and sisters, we're going to find out that to be brought means somewhere. What does he want to bring us? Look what the prophet says. Education, page 15. Let's read this together. It says, to restore in man the image of his maker, to talk to me, somebody, bring him. Now, say that in one word. To bring him back in one word, what would you say? Brought. So the purpose of God is to bring him back or brought him back to what? The perfection in which he was created. To promote the development of body and mind and soul that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. Let's read this together. This was to be the work of redemption. This is the object of education, the great object of life. So the object of life is the work of redemption. And the work of redemption is to bring man back to the perfection in which he was in when God created him. I mean, think of it. Someone says, were we perfect? When God created us, were we perfect? Yes or no? How do I know we were perfect when God created us? Because the Bible says we were made in the image of God. Am I right? Now, question, does the, does the Bible say what the prophet says, yes or no? Look what the Bible says in Hebrews 6. God wants to bring us somewhere. Let's see where God wants to bring us. Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Let's read that together. Hebrews 6 and verse 1. The Bible says, let's read that together. It says, therefore, do what? Leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us, what's the next two words? So God wants to bring us somewhere. What does he want to bring us? It says, let us go on where? Unto perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Where does God want to bring us according to the Bible? Back to perfection. This is the work of redemption. Now, my brothers and sisters, someone says, well, we can never do that. I remember we were doing a meeting like this in another uh, state in the, in the U.S., and there were people coming to the meeting. In fact, one man that was going to college at the time came out and he was listening to the message and he said, I've never heard before that the work of redemption was to bring me back to perfection. He said, I never even knew it was possible. He was so excited. He was a new seven Adventist, excited. And then all of a sudden, he went to his class the next day and was talking to one of his Bible professors. And he said to his professor, he said, I was at a meeting last night and I learned the good news. I learned the good news that Jesus died for me so that he could buy me so that I can be bought so that he can now bring me back to perfection. And the teacher was smiling at first. Then the teacher stopped smiling and said, that's not the good news. He said, it is impossible for somebody to be brought back to perfection. He said, in fact, if you are a scholar and you study the original language, you will know that you don't even know what perfection is. He said, what type of perfection? I'm a scholar. What type of perfection? He said, there's Greek perfection, Hebrew perfection, total perfection, total perfection, in sub a partial perfection, subjective perfection. And the man was confused. What perfection are you talking about? And the next day, he came back to me. Next meeting, we're back into the sanctuary, going to the Bible. He said, he was bewildered. I, I, I tried to tell my teacher, and I said, look, you don't have to get into any fight or any confusion. All you got to do is stay close to the word of God. 
Not to what a man says or what a minister says or what a church says, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in him. We must live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I said, look, you don't have to get into all that confusion. Jesus is very simple. Biblical perfection is what God wants to bring us back to. Don't get into Hebrew, Greek, problems. biblical perfection. Biblical perfection is simple. How do you know biblical perfection? You try telling me that, when, that, that God is perfect. Am I right? The Bible says, be ye therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And if God is perfect, then the Bible says that we were made in his image. So that when we were made in his image, we were made according to perfection, in the likeness of perfection. And then something came to mar and destroy that perfection. Just one thing. What was the only thing that marred that perfection? Sin came in and destroyed the image of God in man. And so if sin destroyed perfection, if sin removed perfection, then how can I be brought back to perfection? Then God must take away my sin. And so biblical perfection is coming to the place where I allow Jesus to take sin out of my heart to take sin off the books of record, to take sin from the books and the experiences of my life so that I have victory over every sin. This is biblical perfection. Now, my brothers and sisters, it's amazing to me that we will let man tell us something. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to let a man make a monkey out of me. Man will say, you believe in evolution. Make a monkey out of you. And, and, and imagine this. Think about it for a moment. How many, uh, did, did, let me see somebody who drove here. Let me, let me see a hand of somebody who drove here today. Let me see the hand of somebody who drove here today. All right. I'm going to put you on the spot. You don't mind if I put you on the spot, my brother. What's your name, brother? Howard. Brother Howard. I'm going to put you on the spot, brother Howard. What color was the car you drove? Uh, gray. gray. All right. Now he says it's a gray car. Now, what if I said to you, now, brother Howard, I know you think your car is gray. But I've got my PhD in colors. And so it's not a gray car, it's really a neon green car. And you just think it's gray. What would you say? (laughs) Praise the Lord! Now my brothers and sisters, this is what we have to go back to because guess where we find the owner's manual in the Bible? And when we go back to the Bible, we would see that we cannot let a man tell us what we can't do or can do, what's perfection and not perfection. The Bible tells us that God is going to bring his people back to perfection. This is the work of redemption. Now, my brothers and sisters, think about this for a moment. Go to the book of Leviticus. What book did I say? You go to Leviticus, Leviticus 16. Look what the Bible says in Desire of Ages 3.11. You go to Leviticus 16. Go to Desire of Ages. Look at the Desire of Ages 3.11. We're going to Leviticus 16. We'll come there in a moment. Now, Desire of Ages 3.11 says, The tempter's agency is not to be accounted an excuse for how much? One wrong act. Satan is jubilant when he hears the professed followers of Christ making excuses for their deformity of character. You ever heard somebody say, Well, I have to sin because I'm only human. I'm going to tell you something. If we're only human, we're not Christians. See, a Christian is not only human, but a Christian partakes of the divine nature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. All things are becoming new. It says there is no excuse for sinning. A holy temper, a Christ-like life is accessible to how many? To every what? Repenting and believing child of God. In fact, before Leviticus 16, let me show you a beautiful promise from the Word of God. Go to 1 John. What book did I say? You're going to 1 John. Just before Revelation, 1 John chapter 3, and we're going to notice a beautiful promise in 1 John 3. You go to 1 John 3. We'll go there in a moment. Now, look what it says. Next quote from Review and Herald, September 25, 1900. It says, he who does not abhor himself cannot understand the meaning of redemption. To be redeemed means, what's the next four words? To cease from sin. That's redemption. Redemption must bring us back to perfection, to a place where we can cease from sin. No heart that is stirred to rebellion against the law of God has any union with Christ. This is what redemption means, to cease from sin. In fact, this says the Savior took upon himself the infirmities of humanity. What does infirmity mean? 
sickness, weakness. He took upon our weaknesses. It says the Savior took upon himself the infirmities of humanity and lived a what type of life? Sinless life. Why? That men might have, what's the next two words? Now, you know what happens? When you start talking about getting victory over sin and being brought back to perfection, people start getting afraid. You know why? Because we start looking at ourselves and we say, look, I can never overcome sin. And you're right. None of us of ourselves could ever overcome sin. With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. See, my brothers and sisters, we're putting too much dependence upon humanity. The secret is not in us. The secret is in the man, Christ Jesus. And the beauty of the plan reveals the beauty of the man. This is the gospel. This is the power of God unto salvation. Now, my brother and sister, it says that men might have no fear that because of the weakness of human nature, they could not overcome. That's why Jesus came to the earth. It said Christ came to make us, talk to me somebody, partakers of the divine nature. Now, you may not like this, but I love this. He came to make us partakers of the divine nature and the life of Christ declares that humanity combined with divinity does not commit sin. This is the gospel. That God can bring us to the place where no longer do we have to commit sin by the power of the indwelling Christ. Now, my brother and sisters, you know the devil tries to make us think that we're going to be sinning until Jesus comes because he understands what that means in the great controversy. Everything is at stake, and we're going to see that tonight. The work of redemption is to bring us back to the place that once God has bought us and paid for every sin, now he can work with man and can begin to restore the broken down condition of mankind and bring us back to the place where we look just like Jesus. In fact, it says this right here. Everyone, not some, signs of the time, July 23rd, 1902. This is one of the most beautiful quotations of all the writings on this point. Let's read this together. Oh, read this with me. It's beautiful. It says, everyone who believes on Christ. How many? Everyone who relies not on themselves, but on the keeping power of a risen Savior that has suffered the penalty pronounced upon the transgressor. That's the lamb who died for us. Everyone who resists temptation and in the midst of evil copies the pattern given in the Christ life will through faith where in the atoning sacrifice of Christ become a partaker of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Let's read this together. It says, everyone who by faith obeys God's commandments will reach the condition of sinlessness in which Adam lived how before his transgression that's redemption that's the everlasting gospel that's the message of seven Adventism that's the message the devil hates that's why he didn't want you and I to study this because if somebody understands this somebody will have victory over sin and Satan must stop this at all costs. He said, oh, let them study time, but don't let them understand the work. Because my brothers and sisters, if the work were to come to an end and no one had victory over sin, Jesus would lose the great controversy. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. See, we don't understand this. We thought it was all over at the cross. We thought when Jesus said it is finished that the whole plan was over. But my brothers and sisters, Satan is still very much in this fight. Have you ever seen basketball before? How many quarters does basketball have? Four quarters. Now, can a man... Lose the first quarter, lose the second quarter, lose the third quarter, and then come back in the fourth quarter and still win the game. Has it ever happened? Yes, it has. Do you know, brother and sister, you're going to find out that the plan of redemption only has three quarters. Satan lost the first quarter in the outer court. Lost the second quarter in the holy place. And Satan now in the most holy place says, if I can come back, I can win the game. Satan is playing the game of life for every soul. And this is what this is about. And no one understands this but a little group of people called Seven Adventists. And today, most of us don't understand anymore. We've lost the message. We've lost our identity. We've got to come back to realize and recognize our distinctive identity so that we can bless our own people and be a blessing to the world. God is trying to show us what this message is. My brothers and sisters, God is trying to bring us back to this place. Now, question, what would happen if God could not bring us back? To perfection. Have you ever let your mind think on that? Because someone says, oh, oh, we'll be sinning until Jesus comes. Well, what would happen if that took place? What would happen if God was not able to give us victory over sin? What would happen if that ever took place? I want you to see something now. Now, here's the plan. Here's the picture. 
Outer court, holy place, most holy place. Here's the whole plan from beginning to end. How many places? How many places? Three places. Now I want to ask you a question. The work begins in the outer court. It ends in the most holy place. But I want to ask you a question about this now. Watch what the prophet says. The intercession of Christ on man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. By his death, he began that work, which after his resurrection, he ascended to complete where? So the work begins on earth, finishes in heaven. Now, my brothers and sisters, question. Are there three plans of redemption or just one? So when I say out of court, is that one plan and the holy place is another plan and the most holy place is another plan or is it just one plan? So if a person has a quarter, a first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, he can say, I won the game because he won the first quarter, but that's not the game. He just won that quarter. You understand what I'm telling you? So when we look at the plan of redemption, most people do not know because they do not study the sanctuary from the Bible that the plan of redemption is broken up into three parts. So my brothers and sisters, three phases. And so Satan was defeated in the first phase at the cross of Calvary, but he still had two other phases to which to come back on. Now, if you want to know what would happen if a people were not brought back to perfection in the final phase, all you had to do is look at what would happen if Jesus would have failed in the first phase because it's the same plan. Do you understand what I'm saying? The same thing that would have happened if he failed in phase one is the same thing that would happen if he failed in phase two, which is the same thing that would happen if he failed in phase three. You understand what I'm saying? So what would have happened if Jesus had sinned when he came to the earth? We would all be lost. That's scary. Now, I don't want to let your mind think on it long enough, but I'm going to show you something for a moment. It's, it's scary. What would have happened if Jesus had failed in phase one of the plan of redemption? Watch what the prophet says, early writing 157. It says, if, I'm, I'm reading from the quotation, if the plan of salvation should be carried out and Jesus should die to redeem man, Satan knew that his own power would be limited and finally taken away and that he would be destroyed. Therefore, it was a studied plan to do what? To do what? To prevent, if possible, the completion or the finishing of the great work which had been commenced by the Son of God. If the plan of man's redemption should fail, Satan would retain the kingdom which he then claimed. What, is it, what kingdom did he claim? He claimed the earth. Because remember, God had given the earth to Adam. Am I right? And as he gave the earth to Adam, when Satan deceived Adam, what was Adam became Satan's. And he became the God of this world. Now, my brothers and sisters, he would have claimed this home as, home as his own. And if he should succeed, he flattered himself that he would reign in opposition to the God of heaven. He said if he could retain the earth, his next plan was to go to all the unfallen worlds and to take control of the entire universe. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says, watch now. This says in Isaiah page 690, it says... But now the history of, uh, of human race comes up before the world's room. You remember, you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was praying? And he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup do what? Pass from me. You can read it in Matthew 26. This is commenting on Matthew 26. It says, the woes and lamentations of a doomed world rise before him. He beholds the impending fate and his decision is made. He will save man at any cost where? To himself. Jesus loves us more than he loves himself. Look what this says. The world's unfallen and the heavenly angels have watched with intense interest as the conflict drew to its what? Close. It says Satan and his confederacy of evil, uh, the legions of apostasy, watch intently this great crisis, not at the cross, but this great crisis where? In the... But the work of redemption has how many parts? You know that we call what happens at the Sunday law and the seal of God and the mark of the beast, we call that not the first crisis, but the final crisis. Now, if there's a final crisis, it means that there had to be a crisis before that. We're going to find that there are three great crises. A crisis in the outer court, a crisis in the holy place, and the final crisis in the most holy place. Now, my brothers and sisters, it says this was the great crisis in the work of redemption of the outer court. It then goes on to say, in this awful crisis, how much was at stake? In this awful crisis, when what? Everything was at stake. If you lost, everything was lost. The universe was lost. That means, brothers and sisters, if he lost in phase two, universe at stake. If he loses in phase three, the universe is still at stake. It says, 
in this awful crisis when everything was at stake, when the mysterious cup trembled in the hand of the sufferer, the heavens opened, a light shone forth amid the stormy darkness of the crisis hour. The angel came not to take the cup from Christ's hand, but to do what? Talk to me, somebody. Strengthen him. And you know, in the final crisis, God's not going to rapture us out of the crisis. He's going to strengthen us to go through it. He's going to give us the power of Jesus Christ. My brothers and sisters, something happened in this crisis. Jesus was gripping the ground. He was sweating great drops of blood. He was fighting. He understood. Now look at what this says. Desire of 86, As Christ felt his unity with the Father broken up, he did what? Fear that in his human nature, he will be unable to endure the coming conflict with the powers of darkness. He felt the human weakness. It says, in the wilderness of temptation, the destiny of the human race had been at stake. Christ was then conqueror. Now the tempter had come for the last fearful struggle. For this he had been preparing during the three years of Christ's ministry. Let's read this together. It says, how much? Everything was what? At stake with him. If he failed where? Here. His hope of mastery was lost. The kingdoms of the world would finally become Christ. He himself would be overthrown and cast out. But if Christ could be what? Overcome. The earth would become Satan's kingdom. And the human race would be forever in his power. With the issues of the conflict before him, Christ's soul was filled with dread of separation from God. You see, Christ knew how much was what? At stake. Now, my brothers and sisters, and that did not stop. That did not stop in phase one. Do you know that in phase three in the most holy place, if somebody does not get victory over sin, then the universe is still at stake. Somebody has to vindicate the character of God. Somebody has to show that there's power in the blood of the Lamb. We cannot just sing about it. We must demonstrate it. We say, would you be free from the power of sin? There is power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you over evil a victory win? There is wonderful power in the blood. We cannot just sing about it. God wants us to experience it. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is what this is about. Go to Romans, uh, 1 John 3. Let me read that quote, quote. Heavenly Father, please, as we look at some final points, help us to see now as we begin to start winding down that if ever there was a time to run to Jesus, it's now so that we can develop this experience where we know you so much that we would rather die than sin. We thank you, dear Father, in Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In 1 John chapter 3, look at what it says beginning in verse 8. Are you there, amen? In verse 8, let's read that together. The Bible says, he that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was what? Manifested that he might destroy the works of what? The devil. Look at the promise in verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Somebody said, did I read that right? Yes, you read that right. Let's look at look, look, the last part. It says, for his seed does what? Remaineth in him and he cannot sin. Why? Because he is born of what? God. God can bring us to the place where no longer do we sin through the power of Jesus Christ. There's power in the blood. What do you say? Now, my brothers and sisters, this is what the world needs to see demonstrated before the universe. But this says, ever since the fall, Satan has been at work to establish himself as the ruler of this earth. He saw the sacrificial offerings which had been ordained to represent Christ as dying for the race and tried in every possible way to pervert them that the people would lose sight of their true meaning. From the Jewish age down to the present time, Satan's warfare has been against two things. Number one, it's been directed against who? Number one, the Son of God. And number two, against his what? work. And remember his work? His work as a lamb bought us. His work as a priest to do what? Brought us back to perfection where we have victory over sin. So Satan is against the work of Jesus. Now he can't stop the son of God because Jesus already died. He resurrected victorious. And so now his plan is to stop his work as a priest inside heaven's sanctuary. And that work is to bring us back to perfection. That work is to give us victory over sin. That work is right before us. And Satan, look what it says. And he, talking about Satan, still flatters himself 
that he will obtain the victory. Satan believes that he's going to be victorious. Why does Satan believe he's going to be victorious? Because he sees the day that every generation, what have we been doing over and over again? We've been sinning and repenting and sinning and repenting. Never have we gotten complete victory. And so Satan says they will never get victory. But he does not understand the blood of Jesus. And God is trying to over, uh, uh, introduce you and I to that experience. Now, my brothers and sisters, wa watch what happens. God tells us he's going to bring us back. In the very first promise of Genesis chapter 3, God said he was going to do something to, uh, to the serpent. Am I right? What did God say he was going to do in Genesis, the third chapter? <clears throat> what did God say he was going to do? In Genesis 3.15, do you remember the text? Let's turn and read there quickly. Let's turn and read there quickly. Genesis chapter 3. Let's read there quickly. Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, notice what the Bible says in Genesis, the third chapter. Beginning in the 15th verse, here God showed us the beginning of the plan of redemption. Genesis 3 and verse 15. Let's read that together. The Bible says in verse 15, are you there? Amen. Let's read verse 15. What does it say? And I will put what? Enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It, the seed, talking about Jesus, shall do what? Bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. What does it mean to bruise his head? What does that mean? Talk to me, somebody. It means that Satan's head is going to be what? Crush. In fact, this is the picture. This is what this artist is trying to demonstrate. Now watch this heel, representative of the heel of Jesus. Now Genesis 3.15 said very soon, even though you made Adam and Eve sin, I'm going to do something in this plan that is going to destroy the kingdom of Satan. He's going to crush that head. Now can you imagine, every time Satan sees that, Satan gets afraid and it's scared. He looks at that and says, my head's going to be crushed. He's afraid of this. Now, you remember, I remember when we used to watch different sports, and you remember watch sports. Every time a good play was done, you know what they do when they take a break? They review, the, the, they replay the clip. You remember that? A great thing was done. Sometimes the, 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 the sportsman would do some special move, and they keep replaying it over and over again, replaying, put it in slow motion. And so I think we should replay it. What do you say? Let's replay that thing. <laughs> Boom! Say <laughs> you get afraid of you. The, the, the announcers, look at this. Christ crushed the head of a serpent. Look at it. Boom! Satan's afraid of that. You know, that's getting ready to take place before us. Now, my brothers and sisters, when did the head of Satan get bruised and crushed? When did that take place? When you say on the cross. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you something today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, by God's grace, we're going to open our eyes. The work of bruising Satan's head did not finish at the cross. It started at the cross, but it didn't finish. Now, let me show you that from the Bible. You believe what you see in the Bible, amen? Go to Romans. What book did I say? Not because I say so, but the Bible says so. Go to Romans chapter 16. Now, who, who wrote the book of Romans? Under, under divine inspiration, the apostle Paul scribed out the book of Romans in Romans 16. Now, did the apostle Paul come to Christ before the cross or after the cross? So years after the cross, the Apostle Paul is writing in the book of Romans. And notice what he says in Romans 16. The Bible is unfolding the plan of redemption. Romans 16. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In Romans the 16th chapter, here's after the cross. We know that it started at the cross. This uh, uh, the, the bruising of Satan started at the cross. And we know that because, do you remember, what was it called? Where was the place that Jesus was sacrificed? What was the mountain called? Mountain was called what? Golgotha. Remember what Golgotha means? The place of a skull. And that's the place where the skull of Satan began to be crushed. It started right there. But it didn't finish there. Romans 16, beginning in verse 20. Let's read that together. Romans 16, verse 20. Look how deep the Bible is. Romans 16, verse 20. Years after the cross, after the cross, the Bible says, and the God of peace. What's the next two words? Shall bruise. Question. Shall bruise. What tense is that? Past, present, or future? That's future. So Paul, after the cross, says that the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet. What? Shortly, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, why would Paul, after the cross, say that God is going to bruise Satan's head if it already happened at the cross? There will be nothing to do. But now, my brothers and sisters, we find that that cross only began the work. In fact, that word in, Ro in Romans 16, 20, that word bruise comes from the word in the original, some tribal. It means to crush what? 
completely. In other words, it started, but it was not completed. It was not finished. And so my brothers and sisters, Jesus started crushing Satan's head at the cross, but not finished there. I wonder tonight, as we get ready to close, I wonder where and when is God going to finish the work of crushing Satan's head? Somebody talk to me. Where? What day? Talk to me, somebody. Look at it now. He's going to do it on the day of atonement. This cannot happen until the day of atonement. So now, my brothers and sisters, now, now, now in the back, in the vestibule, please, please, we don't, we don't want to be distracted. We want to, we want to understand what's happening. So now, my brothers and sisters, on the day of atonement, does the Bible say so? Where? Go to Leviticus 16. Now, you did your homework. Homework was go where? What did I tell you to, to, to read the homework? What did I tell you to read what? Leviticus 16. Did you do your homework? Yes. Praise the Lord. Then you'll understand. Look at Leviticus 16. Go to Leviticus 16 chapter. Let's go to Leviticus 16. Now, my question is, in Leviticus 16 chapter, we want to find where that God crushes the head of Satan. Now, Leviticus, the whole chapter is talking about the Day of Atonement. We don't have time tonight to go through the whole chapter, but we want to come to the end of the Day of Atonement. Look at the end of the Day of Atonement. That's when the head is crushed. Look at verse 20 of Leviticus 16. Are you there? Amen. Let's read verse 20 together. What does it say in verse 20? It says, and when he have made an end of reconciling the holy place, that is the most holy, and the tabernacle of congregation, that is the holy, and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. The live goat is a symbol of Satan. You remember, just as Jesus has many names, Satan has many names. He's called the great dragon. He's the serpent. He is here, another symbol of Satan is this goat. And so the Bible says, in verse 21, and Aaron shall lay how much? Both, verse 21, and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat. So now my brothers and sisters, watch it now. So the work, it says, by his death, he began the work which he went to complete where? In heaven. This is what was happening on the Day of Atonement. Now, on the Day of Atonement, he begins to finish this work. What does he do? The priest comes out of the most holy place. Am I right? He takes the sin, and he puts the sin where? Where does he put the sin? On the... Now, tell me something. Does he put it on the tail of the scapegoat? Does he put it on the feet of the scapegoat? In the shadow, he puts it on the... Why? Now, please, before you answer, I have faith in you tonight, Barry. I have faith to you tonight in this church. I have faith in you tonight. Why does he put his hand on the head of the scapegoat instead of on the tail? Because he is symbolizing the finishing of the work of crushing the serpent's head that was prophesied at the very beginning in Genesis 3.15. He declared the end from the beginning. Does it make sense? And so now, my brothers and sisters, but look at this now. What if we don't get victory over sin? Now look, what does he use to crush the head? Is it the hand of the priest? No. It's the sin that is transferred from the priest to the head of the scapegoat that crushes his head. You remember when Jesus died on the cross, the Lamb of God? What killed him? Was it the spears that went through his hand? Was the nails through the hand? Was the spear in his side? What killed the lamb? It was the laying on of sin on Jesus. Am I right? That's why in Gethsemane he said, I am exceedingly sorrowful even unto... He had not been touched by one person. It was the weight of sin that crushed out his life. And what is going to kill sin and sinners is sin itself. The wages of sin is death. And so, my brothers and sisters, but where does the priest get this sin from? Did, the, did, did Jesus sin? Yes or no? No. So, where did Jesus get the sin from? He got it from the sanctuary, am I right? But where did the sanctuary get the sin from? The sanctuary didn't sin. Where did the sanctuary get the sin from? The sanctuary got the sin from who? From you and I. But before Jesus can come and crush Satan's head, guess how much sin he must take from the congregation? Look at what the text says. Leviticus 16, verse 20. 
21. Look what it says, verse 21. Let's read it carefully now. All together. We're going to read it slowly this time. It says, and Aaron shall lay. Now remember, this is the type. And what is done in any type is foreshadowed. It must be done in reality. In the type, notice the three things that happens in the type. Let's read it together. Look what it says. It says in verse 21, let's read together. It says, and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him how much? Confess over him how much? What? All his iniquity. Is that all? What else? All his transgression. Is that all? What else? And all his what? Sin. Now I want to ask you, what is iniquity? Known sin. What is transgression? Sin. The trans sin is the transgression of the law. What is sin? Sin. Why three times? That's a whole other study. We won't go there tonight. But three times he said this. All their iniquities, all their transgression, all their sins. Let's say it together. All their iniquities, all their transgressions, all their sins. One more time. All their iniquities, all their transgressions, all their sins. So clearly that's all sin. Am I right? So now, my brothers and sisters, we can see that at the end of the Day of Atonement, all of the sin is with the priest. Am I right? So how much sin does the congregation have? So there are less of sin because all of them are with the priest. Am I right? Before he leaves the most holy place. All of them are there before he comes back the second time. All of them are there. So then how much sin does the congregation have? None. So then what would the congregation be? Talk to me, somebody. Sin less. So in the type, in the shadow, in the example, at the end of the day of atonement, God must have a sinless congregation. That's the type. And if he doesn't, he cannot come back the second time. Because if he comes back without sin, he cannot crush the head of Satan. Because it's sin that does that. And so sin will remain and retain this world and take over the universe. But my brothers and sisters, I read of no such thing in the Bible. Jesus is going to have somebody that gets victory over sin by the power of the indwelling Christ. I want to be a part of that. What do you say? And so my brothers and sisters, tomorrow night we're going to talk about more how we're going to get this. But I want to close tonight because this has to happen. Guess what? Not only does this sin have to, uh, have to come to crush the serpent's head. But this sin, brothers and sisters, has to crush the serpent's head on time. Because the event must take place. In other words, God must have a single congregation, but it must happen on time. Now question, is there a time to develop this sinner's congregation? Is there a time for the priest to come out? Because it has to happen where? On time. Is there a time? Yes or no? What is the time? What is the time? It says, the great plan of redemption results in fully bringing back man into God's favor. All that was lost by sin is what? Restored. Not only man, but the earth is redeemed. To be the eternal abode of the obedient for 6,000 years, Satan has struggled to maintain possession of the earth. But now God's original purpose in his creation is what? Accomplish. So my brothers and sisters, do you know that at the end of 6,000 years, the time comes for the priest to come out of the most holy place to put this sin on the head of the scapegoat. Am I right? Now my question is, what time is that? Look what this says. Who brings the scapegoat into the wilderness? What did the Bible say? We read in Leviticus 26. Who brings him? The fit man. What does the fit man mean? That word fit man in the original is not talking about strong. You know, you're talking about a strong, fit man. That, that's not what it means. That word fit in the Hebrew comes from a word that means itty. That, that, that Hebrew word strong, strong man is itty. What does it mean? Talk to me, somebody. Timely. So the fit man is a man that comes on time. So everything that the Bible says, the prophet said, it's man who comes on time. Now look what this says. A noise shall come to the ends of the earth. For 6,000 years, the great controversy has been in progress. The Son of God and His heavenly messengers have been in conflict with the powers of the evil one to warn, enlighten, and save the children of men. But then it says, let's read this together. Now what? All have made their... This was your homework, 656. You read 655. Now, my brothers and sisters, 
When did all make their decisions? By the end of what? Six thousand years but then it says this listen carefully now please listen carefully this is of the utmost importance this is the crux the crux of everything the wicked have fully united with satan in his warfare against god when at the end of what six thousand years now listen the time has come when at the end of what six thousand now listen to me carefully the time has come for what? At the end of 6,000 years. Now, answer carefully. Now, now, the place to understand this, remember, thy will, God, is in the? What is it time for at the end of 6,000 years? Talk to me, somebody. It's time for the crushing of Satan's head. But he cannot do that unless he can do this to vindicate his authority. He cannot honestly with vindication with justification he cannot destroy satan unless he can prove that there is a people that can keep the law of god that god was not playing favorites when satan fell that he let him, him he destroyed him but then saved some sinners and we couldn't uh, stop sinning he was not playing favoritists there must be something that vindicates the character of god before the universe now my brothers and sisters at the end of six thousand years this is going to take place so then that act that, that that begs us to ask the question where are we when? Now at the end of 6,000 years. Am I right? These types were fulfilled not only as to the event, but as to the time. Now, my brothers and sisters, what we need to do is count up. We want to find out where are we at the end of 6,000 years. Are you ready? Now, you don't sound like you're ready. You ready? How close in 2004, are we to that 6,000 year period? Because this event, not might, it has to be fulfilled at the time pointed out in the symbolic service. And remember now, the outer court represents what? Any typical outer court represents what? Heaven or earth? The earth. The antitypical sanctuary represents heaven or earth? Heaven. So when Jesus leaves the most holy place in heaven, and comes to the outer court, it is typifying Jesus coming back the second time from the most holy place. Are you following me? And this must happen at the time pointed out in the symbolic service. In like manner, the times which relate to the second event must be fulfilled at the time pointed out in the symbolic service. So it must happen one time. And the time is 6,000. And so today, we need to find out where are we in relationship to this in 2004, Excuse me, in, in 2024, how close are we to the 6,000-year limit? Is that, is, that a good, is that a good question? Someone says very close, and we are. We want to find out how close tonight. But no, we can't find out tonight. Our time is finished. I'm, we're going to come to you right here. Now, brothers and sisters, listen, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. Tomorrow night, we were able to talk about the great work of time tonight. We begin to start talking about not only the time, but now we also start introducing the what? The work. How much time for redemption? How much time? 7,000 years. 6,000 on earth, 1,000 in heaven. We know that by the end of 6,000, Jesus has to come out that most holy place. That's the limit of his time in the most holy place. And in order for him to do that, the work has to be accomplished on this earth. What is the work that has to be accomplished? First, he had to die for us. Did he die for us already? Then he had to go to heaven and begin to bring us back to perfection. Has he finished that work? If you look at you and I, you know he hasn't finished that work because still we don't look just like Jesus. I mean, somebody can cut us off on the road and some things come out of our mouths that should never come out. Somebody does something wrong to us and we, we, we're back and forth. The bickering that happens sometimes between husband and wife, family, parents and children. We're not yet looking just like Jesus. There are still sins that no one else knows about. It's possible for us to put on suits and look nice when we come to church. It's possible for us to sit upstairs and downstairs, preach. It's possible to do all of that and still have sin in our lives. You know, there's some people struggling with secret sins, darling sins, cherished sins. God is wanting to give us victory tonight. People struggling with pride. People struggling with getting a victory over appetite. People struggling to spend time in prayer. People are struggling listening to the wrong things, looking at the wrong things. People are struggling with pornography. People are struggling with every form of sin. But you know that in order to see Jesus, we must have victory over every sin. And if we're honest, every one of us has to say, Lord, 
I don't have that experience right now. This is the great work that must happen in a little time. We don't have much time left. And so my brothers and sisters, tonight for homework, I'm going to make the homework very simple tonight. The homework is going to be this. Two questions that I want you to talk to God about. Forget everybody else. Just two questions. Number one, please write it down. I want you to do this alone with God in your homework. Number one, what is in my heart that is keeping me from Jesus? What is in my heart that needs to come out? That's the first question. What's in my heart that needs to come out? And the second question, what is not in my heart that needs to come in? And I'll tell you, for every one of us, the greatest thing that needs to come into our heart is Jesus Christ. I want Jesus. What do you say? We're going to see by the grace of God that we don't have much time left. It's going to make complete sense. And everything we see in the world that's winding down is showing us if ever there was a time to get ready, it's now. Do you want to be ready for the coming of the Lord? Is that your desire tonight? Praise the Lord. If that's your desire, would you reverently kneel with me as we approach the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you have not given up on us. That, Lord, time is running out, but you are going to win this game of life. Lord, normally in the world when sports are being played and the final seconds come down, the best persons are put on the game. The final seconds of the time, the best players are put on the court. But Lord, in this last generation, you have put the worst players on the court. The weakest generation. The most unspiritual generation. And Lord, you're going to allow the worst generation to show the greatest demonstration that the universe has ever seen, and this will give glory not to man, but this will give glory to you, for your power is able to take the weakest sinner and give us victory over every sin through the power of the indwelling Christ. You want to use us as that example. I want to pause the prayer. There's someone that says, Lord, I want to have victory over the sins of my life. I want to know you, Jesus. I want to get rid of these darling cherished sins, and I want Jesus. Just raise your hand wherever you are. And by raising your hand, you're saying, Lord, I want your help. I don't want to leave with the same sins that I came with. I want victory. God knows what it is. He knows those secret sins. Today, this week, ask him what's in my heart that needs to come out and what's not in that needs to come in. Father, you see our our lifted hands. I'm lifting mine. Lord, we need Jesus. Thank you for what you've done tonight. Thank you for your power. Thank you for the gospel that shows us that man is not only to be bought by your death, but by your life we're to be brought back into harmony with Jesus. We thank you, Father, for we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated for a silent moment of meditation. Amen. Did you learn anything tonight? Are you happy you're here tonight? Do you want some more of the Word of God? Tomorrow night we're going to continue. I tell you, every night it gets harder, but you've made up in your mind tonight, you must do it again. What time tomorrow night? Now, by God's grace, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. Tomorrow night, look, look, that traffic tried to even get worse today. I didn't know they didn't get traffic like that in Barry. I tried to get a little worse today, but tomorrow night we're going to be at 658. Amen? 658. By God's grace, let's pray for each other. I'm praying for you. Please pray for me. I'll see you tomorrow at 658. May God bless. You may consider yourself dismissed. For the soul.